Welcome to St. Columba Church. Welcome to St. Columba Church. We are people discovering and sharing infinitely fuller life in Jesus. Whoever you are, wherever you are from, you are welcome. As we gather today, to discover and share more of life in Jesus. Let's listen for the word of God. This is Acts chapter 3, verses 11 to 26. While the man held on to Peter and John, All the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you say it as as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed and you disowned him before Pilate though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It's Jesus' name and faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, then, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah, who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise you up, a prophet, like me, from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, All the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days, and you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, Through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. I held on to Peter and John. My legs were strong, but I wasn't completely confident, and it felt odd to be standing this tall, having sat on my bottom for my entire life. We stood under Solomon's colonnade, a long cedar-covered walkway with grand marble columns holding up a wooden roof. I heard the crowd shouting, It's the cripple! It's the cripple that sits at the gate! He's standing next to the Jesus' apostles! How on earth is he standing? The people in the courts rushed over to get a better view of us, filling the colonnade and spilling out in the afternoon sun into the court next to it. Others were coming through the gate, my beautiful gate, but also the gates to other parts of the temple. They were emptying parts of the temple to come and see me, the cripple, the cripple who doesn't have a name, who nobody would look in the eye, were suddenly all looking at me. I was breathless with happiness. I was still singing God's praises, but still standing firmly between Peter and John. Peter spoke up. Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. 
you handed him over to be killed and you disowned him before Pilate. Though he decided to let him go, you disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of that. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know has been made strong. It is in Jesus' name that the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. I could hear pain in his voice. Jesus, the man he had dropped his nets for and followed for years, his teacher, his friend, his saviour, his God, had gone. But he was not alone. His God was still beside him and within him. Peter spoke again. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, and that times of refreshing will come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah, who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through the holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken foretold these days, and you are heirs of the prophet and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. The crowd continued to swell. Nobody was talking. They were all listening to Peter and craning their necks to see him. The Jewish people were listening to Peter and hearing Jesus' message. Peter was speaking with such wisdom. He was a fisherman, but he was quoting scripture and explaining that the prophets over the centuries had foretold that the Messiah, that Jesus, would come and would suffer and that prophecy was fulfilled. He was explaining that Jesus died and was resurrected. The story wasn't over, that what Jesus taught was relevant, that they still needed to repent, that the Jewish people were still God's people, but they needed to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. The priests, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were standing in the back in the shadows of the marble columns and I could see the discomfort and the fury in their eyes as they watched us. Creation, Adam and Eve and the fall Noah, the flood and the Tower of Babel God had a plan, he told Abraham And promised his family would be God's people, in God's place Under his rule, they will know his blessing His blessing, his blessing God's people, in God's place Under his rule, they will know his blessing His blessing, his blessing Abraham Isaac and Jacob, twelve sons A nation, our slaves in Egyptian hot sun But God had a plan, through Moses his man He rescued them so they could be God's people, in God's place, under his rule They will know his blessing, his blessing, his blessing 
God's people, in God's place, under His rule, they will know His blessing, His blessing, His blessing. Joshua conquered the land and moved in. Judges showed that they needed a king. God had a plan through David, his man. He ruled them and made them to be God's people in God's place under his rule. They will know his blessing, his blessing, his blessing. God's people in God's place under his rule. They will know his blessing, his blessing, his blessing. Solomon. Brought wisdom and blessing, but then division, rebellion, so God punished them. He sent them away, his prophets proclaimed that one day a remnant would be God's people in God's place under his rule. They will know his blessing, his blessing, his blessing. God's people in God's place. Under his rule, they will know his blessing, his blessing, his blessing. Jesus, everything finally revealed. The church, share the good news with the world. God made his plan before time began. When Jesus returns, we will be. God's people in God's place under his rule they will know his blessing his blessing his blessing God's people in God's place under his rule they will know his blessing his blessing his blessing So if we were having a conversation and I said to you, Jesus died on a cross for you, what would you say? Perhaps that's not the kind of thing you'd expect just to kind of pop up in conversation over an ordinary everyday coffee or an extraordinary event that the world is going through. But it turns out it's the kind of thing that Jesus people have on their minds and that they want to put on the minds of anyone else who will listen. In Acts chapter 3, verses 11 to 26, it's only Jesus. Peter and John, propping up the man that they've just healed in Jesus' name, have an excited crowd gathering around them in wonder, and they say, not us, Jesus. This crowd is wanting an explanation for the exciting thing that they've just seen happen. But the disciples of Jesus want to talk about the sobering charge. You killed Jesus. Peter and John want to declare to a crowd, including some very sceptical people, God raised Jesus. And to anyone who would stick around for long enough to listen to what they had to say about him, Peter and John said, turn to Jesus. So not us, Jesus. You killed Jesus. God raised Jesus. Turn to Jesus. In verses 11 to 13. The thing that Peter and John did that made a crowd go wow, that invites an explanation. Peter is quick to give it. He says, not us, Jesus. Why are you staring at us like we've got more power than you? Why are you looking at us like we're kind of so godly and spiritual people and that's why this healing happened? We're really not that godly, that spiritual, to be honest. Did you catch the bit where we said, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, walk? So it wasn't us at all. It was Jesus. 
Now let me tell you a bit more about him, says Peter. When people noticed them, Jesus' disciples put the spotlight firmly on Jesus. Like we saw last week, they use his name. They will not fail to give the glory to Jesus, have his name on their lips when people are looking their way. And the crowd was probably like, why are we getting a sermon about Jesus? We just wanted to know about this cool miracle thing that we just saw. But Jesus' friends want to make Jesus known. And so they use this chance to say more about him. It's a mark of truly growing discipleship that the spotlight goes Jesus' way. Think about how far Peter and John have come since Luke's gospel, where we catch them more than once, arguing about who's the greatest amongst them, kind of jostling for that position. And all of the insecurities that there were with that, asking Jesus, which one of us is your your right hand man? You know, who's the greatest? And now they've become people who don't worry or care about their position or how they are perceived by others. It's just that people notice and wonder at Jesus. That's all that's in their heart now. And that is a big shift that they've gone through. And that is a shift that the Christian disciple goes through in in our life, in our growing life of faith in Jesus. Just a little example. Uh, Last week, you won't like me saying it, but it's a good example, Sheena. So I'm going to use it. You know, people notice Sheena's great storytelling around uh, Acts 3 last Sunday. And immediately she put the spotlight on Jesus and said, you know, I can only write what I'm given. It's God that gives me these and I, and I just write them out and tell them. Fantastic example of just let's point to Jesus when people notice us. So let me ask you, is it only Jesus that you want to see praised? Is that what your heart's got to yet? Humility isn't thinking little of yourself. It's thinking of yourself little and thinking way, way more about Jesus, filling your mind a lot and filling the minds of others a lot with Jesus. So it's only Jesus. And then Peter becomes a bit bold and confrontational. Now we've seen this in his preaching style in Acts 2. We're going to see it again next week in Acts 4, that Peter is quite fond of going, you killed Jesus. Now he puts the spotlight again, not on himself, but this time on his audience, on the people listening to him. And he's really bold. He builds up the blows one by one here in verses 13 to 15. He says, you disowned him when he was declared righteous. Ouch. He says to the people, You disowned the holy and righteous one and you asked for a murderer. Ouch. And then he goes on and and what a a kind of wonderful phrase. So simply put, but you killed the author of life. Ouch. Again, if you were in that crowd, you might be thinking, we only came for a look to find out what all the fuss is about. But now there's these arresting words coming your way about how you killed Jesus. Peter's really, really bold and he's been known for it all through his Bible story. And these days, God's using it for this really bold, straight, spirit led preaching that he does here. I imagine that most of us won't confront people quite the way that Peter confronted an astonished crowd. But do you confront people with Jesus? Do you confront people with the cross at all? Or are you hoping that I'll do that if people stay awake and concentrate long enough on whatever long sermon I'm preaching someday? Or do you hope that some persuasive preacher that you found on YouTube will do the trick if you send a link to people. Say, Just have a listen to this. And you WhatsApp the link to them, job done. What if you are supposed to confront 
your friends, your family, with Jesus, with the cross. In the first Wednesday prayer time that we had as a church, uh, just a few weeks back, start of October, during the quiet listening prayer that we did about the Lord's Supper passage in 1 Corinthians 11, the words that jumped out at me were, you proclaim Christ's death until he comes. You proclaim Christ's death. And I was praying that through the next morning with God and felt like God was was giving me a question. So here's a question. Use this. Ask people this. If I said to you, Jesus died on a cross for you, what would you say? We've talked before about asking people good questions as a way of getting into talking about Jesus with them. So I've often encouraged you to ask people, who do you say Jesus is? And that's opened up all sorts of interesting avenues and conversations over the years for me as I've I've done that with a few folks. Here's another question to commend to you. You're chatting to someone. You say, if I said to you that Jesus died on a cross for you, what would you say? And I wonder, I mean, can you picture it now? Can you picture who you're asking and and what the conversation might go like? Can you guess? Will they affirm it? Will they deny it? Will they ask you, what do you mean? Will they have other questions for you? Where could it go? Here's where I hope and pray that some of the conversations that I'll have with that question might go. And this is me as well, making an attempt to reflect what Peter's doing in the passage here. Preach Christ crucified. I hope that I can say to a friend, what I've discovered is that there's things in my life, things about me that led Jesus to a cross, but he also chose to go there for me. So that those things, the sin, so the the selfishness, the rottenness, the putting myself first, forgetfulness of others and kind of ignorance of God, putting him on the sideline, that all of that and the guilt for that would be heaped on Jesus on a cross. He chose to die on a cross with that stuff on his shoulders so that what I would have is this open, forgiven, completely embraced relationship with God. And you've got that too, or at least you could have. You know, you've got stuff about your life that led Jesus to a cross. We all do. But he also chose to go there for you. What would it feel like to have a clean conscience for the word God to thrill you with hope instead of make you feel deeply uncomfortable? I don't know all of the things about you that Jesus went to a cross for. You'll know most of them, way more than me, but I bet you don't know all of them either. God does, and yet still chose to go to a cross in Jesus Christ for you. He did that because he loves you. And he would love you to respond to that love and that gift. The heart of the good news about Jesus is this. He died for you. That calls for a response from you and from those that you share the name of Jesus with. So frame it in a way that invites a response. If I said to you, Jesus died on a cross for you, what would you say? I know, I know, you're thinking, yes, Scott, fine, that's all a bit forced, isn't it? Well, tell me that Peter wasn't pressing things uninvited here. You're thinking, my friend won't respond to that, so you're just not going to do it. Fine. But actually, the truth is, we're only asking the people that stick around long enough to listen. We know when people don't want to to hear it because we've we've put it out there 
And unless you put it out there, you don't actually know. You don't know who those people of peace are, those who actually have God ears to hear and might be saved by this. Unless you try confronting them with a question or two first and we don't assume what our friends responses are going to be. Is there someone that God is asking you, he's nudging you? Go on, ask them that question or one like it. Only Jesus. He gets the glory for the things amongst us that draw people's attention. He gets the platform in the conversations that we open up about the cross with those who listen. And it's only in Jesus that resurrection life is found. God raised Jesus. Peter goes on in verses 15 to 16, reminding the crowd that if they think they've witnessed something amazing just now, it's nothing compared to what Peter, John and their friends witnessed. They witnessed the life of Jesus. They witnessed Jesus dying. They witnessed Jesus raised to life. And that same power and authority in Jesus is what brought the healing and the wholeness of life to this man that's standing with Peter and John now. Finally, Peter does the bit that the crowd's been looking for. He explains how this paralysed man is standing, but he won't do it before first preaching the crucified and risen Jesus. Jesus is risen and that truth is changing everything for the man whose life was once begging and is now life to the full. And for Peter and John who once scrabbled for self-worth and now boldly proclaim Christ instead. Verses 17 to 26 tell a big picture story of the whole of their Bible what we call the Old Testament, pointing to Jesus, of Abraham and Moses and all of the prophets from Samuel onwards, pointing to the Jesus who would suffer death and rise again for us, who would be the fulfilment of every promise made to their ancestors, who would be the one through whom all peoples of the earth would be blessed. Peter says, only Jesus. It's all been pointing to him. And he tells us something about where we are in the story of the kingdom of God. Have a look at verse 21. Peter says that Jesus must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. Until the time comes for God to restore everything, for his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. The end of the story is heaven coming to earth, the kingdom of God completed, God's people in God's place, under God's rule and in God's blessing. Eternal life is Jesus returning to be king over his kingdom in a completely restored and renewed new heavens and new earth. That's what the Bible describes. Not us going up to heaven, but that bringing together of all things. And that is what Peter's talking about here. But the kingdom of God, it started, it's begun, it's already breaking into this world. It broke in when the Son of God pierced the world silently, incarnately, as a human baby. It arrived with a bang when he grew up and he announced, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news. It took hold in this world, the kingdom of God, when the world pierced him on a cross and Jesus' kingship was declared at an empty cross and an empty grave. It's begun. The kingdom of God breaks into the world now. It's growing now and it calls for a response. 
The watching world is called. Join in. Come on in to the kingdom of God. Come with us. And Peter tells us how in verse 19. He echoes the call that he learned from his master. He learned from Jesus. Repent. And he even explains for us what it means. Change direction. Turn to God. If you've spent a year walking away from God, if you've spent a lifetime walking away from God, now turn to him. Peter says here too, it's only Jesus. To turn Godward is to be Jesus focused, Jesus centred, Jesus defined. It's to become somebody who's defined by Jesus. I've shared the story before uh, of when I was at a, a gathering of a few friends and um, Duncan Gowdy was there. And one of these guys, not someone who's at church, not, not a Christian guy, was asking Duncan, you know, where are you from? Duncan mentioned all the many places that he has lived and been. And, and the guys like uh, Duncan said, I couldn't tell you where I'm from, really. And the guy said, oh, well, what defines you? And quick as a flash, Duncan said, Jesus. I think the guy didn't know what to make of that. But the point is, it was there. It's on the tip of his tongue. Jesus defines Duncan. Uh, and isn't that great if that's true of us and we can just say it like that? We're defined by Jesus. It's when you know you've repented, you're in the kingdom of God, you're defined by Jesus. It's all or nothing here. In Jesus is life to the full, now and forever. A part in a kingdom that's breaking in, that's growing, will last forever and we'll see all things restored. All that is, is in Jesus, verse 21. And to be apart from Jesus is to be cut off from God and his people, verse 23. It's only Jesus. And repenting means turning to Jesus, depending on his life, his death, his resurrection, his forgiveness, his kingship, his power. And here's what we can look forward to when we do repent and we come on into the kingdom of God that breaks in with Jesus. Peter says in verse 19, he says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. He took time to confront people with the reality of their sin in their lives and on their record. And then he shared the good news. When you repent, that sin isn't just like faded a bit or hidden away or repressed in your mind. It's wiped out. It's dealt with, it's gone. It's a truly new, innocent beginning to your new life. And Peter says, here's another good reason to repent, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Two weekends ago should have been the Baxter's Marathon, Loch Ness Marathon and Festival of Running. And lots of us have run in the marathon, the 10k, the 5k, the half marathon in the spring. Over the years, lots of us have volunteered at this. So if you've ever run the marathon, the 10k, the half marathon, you know that feeling of pressing on towards the finish line. You can picture it. It's your goal. You're, you're going for it and you can kind of picture the big drink that you're going to have when you get to the finish line. You can picture the bath that you're going to run. You can picture the uh, tin of Baxter soup. Uh, other soups are available that you can eat in front of the telly when all of this is done, when it's time for the rest and the feast. But the finish line is some way off. It's coming, but it's not here yet. Meantime, though, there's these really welcome water stops along the way, which lots of you guys have volunteered on over the years. People holding out cups of water to parched runners. Times of refreshing along the way. 
It's, it's not the satisfaction of the rest or the feast at the end, but it's a foretaste and it's a really needed one along the journey. How we need times of refreshing on the journey, especially this year, right? 2020. Now more than ever, are we not in need of times of refreshing from the Lord? One day the kingdom of God is made complete and all things restored and the rest and the feast begins. But but along the way, until that comes, especially like now, after this long, dry, uphill run that we've been having, how we need times of refreshing. And for that, Peter teaches, we need repentance. It's in a new turning to Jesus, a new heart for him, a new focus upon him that people may find times of refreshing from the Lord. Verse 19 says, our church may find it as we repent anew. Our community, our city, our lockside villages may find refreshing from the Lord when they repent and turn to Jesus. It's only Jesus. Let's pray for repentance in our city and our strath and our churches. Pray for the, the refreshment for our city and strath and church that can follow from that. So it's only Jesus. Jesus on our minds and on our lips. Jesus that we celebrate and who gets the glory. Jesus who died for us and Jesus who rose for us. Jesus whom we bring up in conversation and whose kingdom lasts forever. Jesus who wipes away sins and who brings much needed times of refreshing. So let it be only Jesus for you now and always. Amen.
So last week, if you were watching our worship time on YouTube or Facebook, you'll have seen the second half of the prayer course episode, Listening Prayer, from the folks at 24-7 Prayer. We showed that last week. We're going to show it again this week because in our live Zoom service as a church, we didn't get to that video last week. And just to, to keep the whole church together in listening and learning together, we're going to show that uh, part of the episode again today. Okay, okay. So I've got a little bit of an idea yes. here in my head. I've got a question for okay. you. Okay. Um, how do I get better at hearing I God's knew voice? You were going <laughs> to ask that question, yeah. Okay, two simple keys. These are really simple. The first one is this slow down. Mm. God's not in a hurry. And the Bible says, as we've, we've thought about this before, be still and know that I am God. So it's important we build time for quiet and reflection, retreat, contemplation into our daily lives, our weekly rhythms, even our annual rhythms, because those are, those are times when the lake can become still and we can hear God's still small voice a bit better. So you're talking about some sort of like daily quiet time. Yeah, definitely. A, a, a time each day to be still, to read the Bible, to pray, to listen for the whisper of the Holy Spirit. Mm. And I find that when I do that, it's not just that often God does speak to me as I read my Bible or as I'm just still and try to listen, but it primes me to be more attentive to the whispers of the Holy Spirit through the, through the rest of the day. Yeah. Um, so that's the first thing, just try and slow down. Um, one journalist said, atheism is the religion of the busy, you know? Mm -hmm. But then the second thing is this, as well as slowing down, soften up. And what I mean by that is it's so easy, in my own life, I know it's easy for my heart to get pretty hard. I get full of myself, overconfident, over busy, sin creeps in, all kinds of stuff. And it just makes me kind of resistant, actually, to to tuning in yeah. to Radio Jesus, you know. <laughs> Jesus says, um, do you have ears to hear what I'm saying? Mm. Again and again, like in, in the Gospels, which means it was possible to have Jesus Christ himself walk into your town and you missed it because you didn't have ears to hear. You were too busy, like, ordering fish or, I don't know, whatever. And you missed Jesus. So... Sometimes I think God is speaking, but we kind of miss it because our hearts actually have got a little bit hard. So we've kind of said so far that everybody can really get better yeah. at recognizing God's voice and that we need to slow down. Yeah. We need to soften up. But some people have done like crazy, terrible things yeah. and said that God was speaking to them. How do we discern whether or not it's God's voice that we're hearing or not? Great question. I apply what I call the ABC principle. A is advice. Get advice from a wise, sane Christian. B is the Bible. Is this word that I think I'm hearing in line with what the Bible says about the character of Jesus and the purpose of God? And then the C is common sense. I honestly think the number one gift that God wants to give to most Christians is common sense. Just sometimes we do such crazy things. Yeah. I've got some great friends, Dave and Molly. They have an amazing marriage, uh, lovely kids. And Dave once told me, um, he and Molly got together, they were, they were um, childhood sweethearts. You know, they, they got together at, at, at school and they just always got on well, loved each other, attracted to each other, you know, they both, love the Lord and so eventually Dave proposed to Molly and she said yes they're engaged and then some super spiritual Christian said oh but have you had a word from God that you're supposed to marry and Dave went into this whole soul searching oh no I haven't had like some big revelation I just really like her we get on really well everyone who knows us thinks we're great together yeah. so, and he needed someone to sit down and go Dave it's okay like God's led you through just the common sense of you guys have a great uh, relationship. So tell us, how does that play out in your life? How do you hear God speak to you? Honestly, the most frequent way that God speaks to me is through the Bible, because it is God's utterly reliable word to us. The Apostle Paul tells Timothy, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. 
But we have to learn uh, to listen to the Bible for revelation, not just for education. We can use the Bible as a conversation starter. One of the best tools for doing this is the Lexio Divina, mm, yes. which literally just means the holy reading. Are you familiar with that? Yes. So this approach to prayerful meditation on the Bible was first popularized by a Carthusian monk in the 12th century using four Latin words, but I'm just not that clever. I'm not very good at Latin. So I do it really, really simply. This is how I do it in my own life. Um, I try and read it, read the Bible. That's familiarization. Then having read the text, I explore it. That's imagination. So familiarization, imagination. Then I pray the text. Okay. So that's where I take it and I turn it into conversation. And finally, I try and enjoy it. That's where it's a celebration of wherever I go with that conversation. Does that make sense? It does. Now, I know there's more resources about this um, in yeah. the tool shed yeah, that's yeah. on the prayer course website. Right. But I think it'd be kind of cool if we just did this right now. Yeah, let's, let's do it. Okay, so why don't we take, let's take the Bible verse we're actually looking at today, which is, Give us each day uh, our daily bread, which okay. comes in Luke chapter 11. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to read it. It might seem a little strange, but I'm going to read it two or three times. Okay. And remember, we're not reading for information. We're reading, you know, for familiarization, first of all. So um, I want you to think what word jumps out at you. Okay. So here we go. Give us each day our daily bread. Give us each day our daily bread. Give us each day our daily bread. Okay, uh, I, I guess the word that's really jumping out to me is, is daily. Oh, okay. um, I think uh, I'm feeling a little challenged about, you know, what we were talking about earlier about the idea of a daily quiet time and, and the idea that maybe God has something fresh for me every day. Okay, that's amazing. Okay, so, so may, maybe this is the Lord speaking to you about something fresh every day. So let's now move from familiarization to exploration and imagination. Let's, let's think about daily bread, mm. okay? So um, what, what, what does daily bread make you think about? Uh, bread, like eating. Yeah, okay, so, and it's it's like a warm, fresh loaf mm. with, like, the smell, you got the smell of that, that beautiful smell of freshly baked bread, and it's like all white, fluffy bread in the middle and a nice, thick crust. Okay, okay, you're making me hungry. Well, that's good, because actually, we want the way we engage with the Bible to be, like, integrated with our actual bodies and our real world. Psalm 34 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Mm. So if this is getting you a bit hungry, that's great. And what I'd suggest is we now turn that into prayer, into a conversation with God. So is this okay? Why, why, why don't you just turn whatever you're thinking and feeling around daily bread into conversation with the Father now? Okay, let's do it. Father, I love the idea of your word being like warm, fresh bread. God, make me hungry for that today. God, I pray that you'd get my spiritual taste buds going. And, and God, I just want to say that I'm sorry for the times that I compromise and that I just sit around eating cold, hard, stale bread. Thank you so much for the stuff that you've been saying to me today, even as I just sit here in conversation with Pete. Sorry, I feel, I feel really bad. But like I, well, I am, I'm interrupting your prayer time, but I just wanted to register something. Just from these seven words that we've been looking at, with this approach, can you see how easily you've just gone into prayer? Mm. It's just easy when the Bible becomes a conversation starter. So keep praying. But I just wanted to pause and just register that easy transition. Yeah. So let's keep praying. Sorry to interrupt. Father, before Pete so rudely interrupted me, <laughs> oh God, thank you for talking to me, God, today, for, for teaching me to recognize your voice. God, I pray this week that you would help me to hear your voice in the people that I meet, in the normal parts of my day, God, and, and just even through your word, God. Lord, teach me to pray. Amen.
So here's a poem by Vivian Hutchings from our church about meeting with God and hearing him as she prays. This is Be Still. Be still, you say, but how? I have a busy head. Perhaps instead of sitting, I should move instead. Into the street I go. I feel the cool, fresh breeze. I get into a rhythm and now feel more at ease. I come to you. I talk to you. I share my busy head. I walk with you. I talk with you wherever I feel led. And now my head is quiet. I give you time to speak. I listen with my eyes and heart. Your voice I try to seek. Can I hear? Can I? How do you speak to me? A sense? A verse? A thought perhaps? A word? A song maybe? And as I wander home again, I consider the time we've had. If nothing else, we're closer now. For this, I can feel glad. We're going to pray together. And as we do that, we really want to focus today on the name of Jesus, the person, Jesus Christ. And to let that fill your heart and fuel your praise. So before we start praying, maybe you just want to close your eyes and, and let me ask you this question. What fills your mind when you hear his name? Jesus. Jesus Christ, who fills even the whole universe, fill us up, we pray. May you be first in our hearts and most on our minds. May you break into our attention every day to make us wonder anew and to, to help us fall in love with you afresh. Jesus, Jesus, may the mention of your name never come alone. May it unsettle the godless, but also draw them hopefully with hope for something more that they are welcome to. May your name cause our sagging spirits to soar a little. Jesus, may your name be made more and more famous here online and in our neighbourhoods, Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. That's what they say. That's what we read here in Acts chapter 3. That's what we believe. So let your name be associated with powerful transformation in this place, in these days. Would you change people's lives in your name, Jesus, and take all the glory due to your name? Let the darkness fear. May your name declared in our city streets and our woodland walks cause evil to retreat. Bring healing. Let healing break out in parched spirits and broken bodies and hope to increase in a world of decreasing hope. All in the name of Jesus, let hope soar. Jesus Christ, 
crucified for me. Just come to the cross now in a moment of quiet and stay there long enough to remember again why you love him so much. Jesus Christ, risen to life. Fix your mind on death being shattered, its grip made powerless by the risen Jesus Christ. So Jesus, in whose name we live and breathe and have our being, it's in your name we also pray. Amen. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen.